How to play Commander Chess. I'm not going to try to pronounce the Vietnamese right now. I'm not quite there yet. But I can show you how to play it. It's rather complicated. This is the original edition of the game. Uh, it comes in a box like this. I understand there's another edition, but it's still the same game. And um, this is the name of the man who created it. Nguyen Kai Hai. Sorry, I don't pronounce that well yet either. But I have been studying this game, and I can show you how it's played. There are a lot of rules of this game, and we'll get to them, but um, the rules of the piece is our good place to start. This is the commander. This is essentially the king piece. It moves like a rook along the lines of the board. In these directions. Um, it can cross the water, the river here. This happens to be one of the passing zones, sort of a bridge, but it can cross other parts of the river too without any problem. It cannot capture, however, with those long moves. It can only capture in the very close proximity to itself one space here where those black spots are. So though it moves very far, it doesn't make great aggressive attacks all the way across the board. It's not allowed to go over a line that's occupied by the other commander. So, for instance, if the other commander were standing here, then it couldn't go pet, it couldn't go this far. It couldn't go here or beyond that. For that matter, it couldn't go here or beyond that either. However, if that commander were obstructed by something, then it could move freely here because the rule is it's not allowed to have a straight essentially line of vision. It's not allowed to see the other commander straight down a line. This is somewhat similar to the rule in Chinese chess, where the two generals are not allowed to see each other. So that's the move of the commander. Here's the move of the infantry. It's allowed to move one space along the lines, one point orthogonally. It passes over the river without any difficulty. It does not need to go to these special um, reefs where the water is shallow. If it is by the side of the sea, it is able to attack something in the sea, even though it doesn't move to the sea. So it could attack this piece. It would take it off the board, but actually not move anywhere. It still has an attacking spot there. Normally, it attacks just as it moves, just like any other typical chess piece. There could capture it. Just... The tank moves further than the other piece. This moves up to two spaces along the lines, two spaces orthogonally. It also is allowed to cross the river anywhere. It has the same sort of capability of firing over the river or into the water. Like the other pieces, it lands where it captures, unless it shoots into the water, because it cannot land in the water. So if it were here, it could capture the naval vessel out there. That's a standard thing in this game. Pieces go where they capture, unless they're not allowed to go there on land or sea. This is the militia. This one is able to go one space in any direction, including diagonally. The militia also crosses the river freely, has the same power of capture as it has of movement. The next one I'll show you is the engineer. The engineer is it's in the shape of a bridge because it essentially creates a bridge for others to cross. The engineer moves one point, and the engineer is allowed to carry certain things over the river. I'll talk about carrying after I show you the basic moves. This is artillery. By the way, I put a little tag on the piece with its abbreviation. They don't come like that, but that's the abbreviation that's used when the games are annotated. So, A is for artillery. Now, the artillery has quite a range of fire. It can fire and move three spaces in any direction. like this. You see it can shoot over the water. It can shoot into the sea as well. It is limited though because it's not allowed to cross the river except on the reef unless it is riding with the engineer. However, if it shoots over the water, suppose there were a piece over there like this, and it shot that piece, it would be allowed to go 
and capture it and occupy that spot. It has special ability to cross the river if it is attacking a piece. Otherwise, here it could go across because it's got a reef crossing zone. Here it actually could not go because it has no special reason to cross the river at that point. This is the anti-aircraft gun, large A, small a, anti-aircraft. It has a small range. The special power of this one is that it creates a no-fly zone. Any enemy airplane that would be flying over this zone would be immediately captured, presumably shot down. So if there were an airplane here, trying to fly over to here, it would be passing through there, shot down, and taken off the board. Basically, it shouldn't try to do that, but if, if the player doesn't realize it and does that, it's this player's job to say, nope, you lost your piece. If the airplane attacks a piece like this, it can destroy it, but the airplane will be destroyed in the process. This piece also is not allowed to cross the river, except at the crossing points, unless it is shooting at a piece. In that case, it has a special privilege of crossing the river to go where it's made the shot. This is the missile. It has a very powerful defense against air attacks. I'll show you the diagram in here. This book shows how the anti-aircraft gun, as we were saying, has a circle around it. It covers that area. This missile also has an area, but it's much bigger. It's literally a circle, a little bit compressed in this particular board, but it's literally a circle. Uh, it reaches out two in every direction. So it does not go two diagonally because that's not part of the circle, but does reach one diagonally. So the anti-aircraft zone that this creates includes all these points and anything flying through that zone. And it's also allowed to move in the same way. It's a very important piece because it defends so much area against aircraft coming in. And aircraft attacks are one of the big threats in this game. It moves the same as what you have there, so it can move forward, backward, or sideways too, or diagonally one. Just as with the artillery, it's not allowed to cross just anywhere on the river. It can cross in the special crossing zones, or it can take a ride with the engineer, or it can shoot something across the river and therefore take its place across the river because it has made a strike specifically. The Air Force is very powerful. There are two of them. It actually moves four in any of the eight directions. It's a very wide range. Now it's considered to be flying, so it can go over anything that would be in its way. The airplane also has a special ability. It can strike something and then come back to where it left from. The exception is that if it strikes another airplane, it has to stay on that spot. It cannot fly through a zone that's protected by anti-aircraft. So here's an anti-aircraft gun, so that would prevent it from flying there. If it did go there and to attack something, it could still get it, but it would be lost in the process. And usually you wouldn't sacrifice an air force for an infantry. The air force can strike something at sea. If that ship were there, it could strike that. It cannot land in the sea. There's a lot of basic logic in this game. An ordinary airplane does not land in the ocean. It can possibly land onto an aircraft carrier. We'll talk about that in a minute. This is the Navy. It has a pretty good range. It can go four spots in any direction, although it has to stay in the water. It's considered to be a compound unit. It's a ship, for one thing. It's considered to have torpedoes that can shoot other ships. It's considered to have an artillery that can shoot onto land. And it's considered to have an anti-aircraft gun that gives it protection from incoming airplanes. Here, these black ones represent its anti-aircraft potential. Any aircraft flying 
within that circle or hitting it will be destroyed. Sometimes an aircraft would destroy a Navy vessel and sacrifice itself because the Navy vessel is so important. When it fires on land, it only has the capability of shooting three, just like the anti-aircraft gun. So it can go this far firing on land. And just like the other pieces, if it fires somewhere where it can't go, it takes the piece off the board, stays in place. That's its move. If it fires somewhere where it can go, like here, it goes ahead and goes there. As I was saying, it can fire three on land, because that is its artillery capability, but it can fire four in the water, because that's the range of its torpedoes. So from here, it could strike that Navy vessel right there. Okay, and let me show you this last piece, headquarters. It doesn't move at all. It only creates a safety area for the commander to go to. The commander can, well not from there, but the commander from here, for instance, could go onto the headquarters, and there it would be partially protected. Anything except the artillery, the Air Force, or the Navy, which has artillery on it. So, if an infantry, say, were threatening it, this is what would happen. The infantry could not attack it, but it could first attack to break the bunker, and then it would be attacking this. But, for instance, if an aircraft were threatening it on the bunker, it's just in check and has to move. The bunker doesn't matter to the aircraft, to the Navy, or to the artillery. Yeah, he's got to get out of there, and he can go far, so... If he went that far, he'd be safe. Let's talk about pieces being carried by other pieces. Pieces that carry others are basically the tanks, the Air Force, of course, the Navy, and the engineers. Pieces that ride on others are, well, first of all, the tank or the Air Force can ride on the Navy, okay? It can be a carrier for tanks or an aircraft carrier. How does that happen? Well, the tank would go to the Navy vessel. As a move, it would go onto it. The airplane, similarly, could fly to the vessel, and as a move, it would mount that. The Navy can be loaded with a tank, aircraft vessel, and another rider. Um, it would be unusual, but it could even have the commander on top of all those. And it would move like the ship. Everything is on the ship. So it would move like that until the other pieces depart from it. Let's talk about the engineer for a moment. There are certain pieces of machinery which are too heavy to cross the river. They can cross on these special crossing zones, but they can't cross in other places can take a ride on the engineer, the idea being that the engineer is actually a bridge building unit. Let's see, those are the artillery, the anti-aircraft gun, and the missile. Any of these can mount on there, and then the engineer can make a move to come over the river. So who can ride on a tank? A commander could ride on a tank. Infantry can ride on the tank. Militia can ride on the tank. Who can ride on an airplane? Infantry, commander, militia. There's a very clear logic to this. These are, you know, personnel. They can ride on an airplane. Who can ride on the Navy? Personnel. Aircraft, tanks, and this is sensible too. This craft can carry even these heavy vehicles and these individuals. The ship is allowed to move freely in the sea up to four points. It can move diagonally. It can include going to the river and of course these points along the bank are considered within its range. 
it can go into the river, but it can't go as far as this reef or any further. Clearly, this is a shallow water area. It can shoot up to three points on the land, so when it comes along land, it's a very powerful attacking piece. However, it can get stuck in the river because escape channels are rather narrow. Here's an important point about the Navy. This is considered to be several pieces at once. It's the ship itself, it's the anti-aircraft gun, it's the artillery guns. So it's actually allowed in one move to shoot more than one of those guns. For instance, if it shoots the Navy here, it can also at the same time be shooting its artillery gun in this direction. So in one turn, it can shoot this artillery and shoot this naval vessel. There's another instance where one side can move essentially more than one move at a time. That's when pieces are stacked up and riding on each other. Here's an example. Suppose this Navy piece had an Air Force on it and also a commander. As they get off of the Navy vessel or strike from the Navy vessel, they can do this all at once. So the commander could go forward to some safe spot. The Air Force could fly off to another area and the Navy might say come down here. One of those pieces might be attacking another, not the commander in this case, but if there were a piece here the Air Force could be attacking it. Those things happen all in one move, which is unusual. I recommend that you go through some of the sample games when you see some of these plays in action. It takes a little getting used to because they're a bit different from chess. Let's just mention pieces going past or over each other. As you know, the Air Force can fly over another piece. It's not obstructed by anything because it's an airplane, so it's flying over something. The artillery can shoot over a piece. So for instance, if this artillery were here and it had a target over there, it could shoot that, boom, land on it, take it off the board. So that's another thing that goes over something. And of course there are no obstructions to the air zone. If this piece is here, say it had another piece uh, here or something, and an aircraft tried to fly through its air protective zone, say like this, it would be shot down at that point, taken off the board. Let's talk about how pieces get status of a heroic piece and what that means. Any piece that puts the commander in check, threatens to capture the commander, the guy with the star, becomes a heroic piece. And once it becomes a heroic piece, it gets extra power. So, for instance, if this guy, actually with his limited move, comes up to the commander, puts him in check, commander runs away, this piece becomes a heroic piece. So where his original move was one space in each direction, his new move is going to be two spaces in each of these directions. And here's something more. Because he was limited to only going on the lines in the orthogonal directions, being a heroic piece also entitles him to going in the diagonal directions. So look what he benefits in power from being a heroic piece. There's the heroic infantryman. Now, same thing for these other pieces that originally move only one space orthogonally. For instance, the engineer becomes a heroic piece. The anti-aircraft gun, when it becomes a heroic piece. Now notice that these pieces not only have the power to move the extra spot, but they also have the power to attack the extra spot too. So even for instance, if this guy were attacking a gunboat out at sea, he would still have that heroic power to attack one step more than he could attack before. The militia originally moves one step in any direction, including diagonally, like this. Now, if it becomes a heroic piece, it can move to the additional points on the perimeter of that. The missile originally can attack these spaces as a heroic piece. It can go one step further. 
like this and attack an additional point two diagonally or three orthogonally. Often an Air Force jet will become a heroic piece and that's very significant. I won't show you all the directions but you know it can go any of the eight directions. So instead of just going four, it can go five along any direction. In addition, the Air Force jet becomes a stealth jet. When it becomes a heroic piece, it can go into enemy firing zones without being shot down. So for instance, previously, this jet would not dare go into the range of that anti-aircraft gun, but now, it can go freely to it and even past it with its move of five in a line. And as I mentioned, that five extends in all eight directions. I'm only showing you one, for example. That's after it puts the commander in check, which often happens because the Air Force is a very aggressive piece. Let's look at the naval unit. As you know, it can travel four spots along the sea or shoot four spots along the sea. If it becomes a heroic piece after checking the commander on the other side, it will have one more range in both shooting and moving. Same thing on land. You may remember that the naval vessel can shoot three onto land because it has an artillery on board. If it becomes a heroic piece, it shoots one further on land. And I'm not going to do each direction, but these guys do move and shoot in all eight directions, including diagonally. The tank, did I mention it can go two steps orthogonally, right? Becoming a heroic piece, it would be three steps orthogonally, but since heroic pieces always are allowed to move diagonally, it would also get three steps diagonally and this would go for all directions, all eight directions as a heroic piece. By the way, if the commander has just one defender left, even though that defender has not checked the opposing commander, it becomes a heroic piece just by virtue of its important status in trying to defend that commander. Let's talk about the object of the game, because that's a little different from chess too. There are a few different ways of defeating the opposing team, and this is significantly different from the main forms of chess. Yes, if you force capture of the opposing commander, that is winning. That is checkmating, like checkmating the king, or as in Chinese chess, it's like checkmating the opposing general. Same idea. But that's only the command attack. You can also win by destroying all of the sea-going vessels, or all of the air force, or the relevant land forces, which includes the infantry, artillery, and tanks. Keep that in mind. Infantry, artillery, and tanks. So, if you lose both of your air force flyers, you have lost the game. The last one is considered to be checkmated when it is forced to be captured, and that is a loss. If you lose both of your naval vessels, you lose one, okay. Second one gets trapped. It's going to be captured no matter what. It is considered to be checkmated, and you lose that way. Same thing if you lose two infantry plus two tanks plus to artillery. Now that's a lot to lose, but the last one you lose gets checkmated, forced to capture, and that loses the game as well. That's how the game loses by checkmate. Now sometimes the game is played with a time clock, usually 10 or 15 minutes. It's, it's pretty quick. And then often checkmate hasn't occurred. In that case, there's a point count. The pieces that are captured are counted up. A few extra points are counted for um, other things. And then whoever has the best point score wins. I'll just run this by you real quickly. I'm going to say it, but you really want to have this list on hand if you're going to be using point score because, you know, it's not so easy to get verbally and visually. So, I'm going to say this from the lowest to the highest. These pieces are all worth 10 points. The infantry, the militia, the engineer, the anti-aircraft gun, and the headquarters. 
Okay, worth 20 points are the tank or the missiles. Worth 30 points is the artillery. Worth 40 points is the air force. And you can kind of remember this because the ones that have a wider range pretty regularly get 10 more points in value. So as I was saying, the Air Force piece is worth 40 points. Now the Navy is an interesting piece because it's added up. It's got the anti-aircraft gun, it's got the artillery, it's got the naval vessel itself with its torpedoes. Anyway, it totals up to a value of 80 points. So there's the point system, which you'll probably want to look at on a piece of paper and sit down with a pencil and make lists and figure that out if you come to that. But um, generally, you're probably going to be going for the checkmates because that's the more familiar approach to the game. And those fast games are usually used in tournaments where everything's timed. You have to have a winner. They go by the point system. Voila. And by the way, if you checkmate the commander and you have the highest point score, then you get 200 bonus points because you actually got the opposing commander without making huge sacrifices. Let's go on to something you definitely want to know, is how to set the pieces up. Now to do that, you notice I've been using this large board, which doesn't really fit easily into my screen here. So I'm going to change this to the smaller board that fits my camera just right. See? Same board, but smaller, still fits the pieces, but it's compact enough so that fits in the screen and the pieces don't get too far away. You can still make them out pretty much. Now, let me show you real quick how the pieces are set up. It's clearly shown in the, in the book or any instruction manual that you'll be getting for this. You can see that it's very symmetrical. If you take the Navy away, everything is entirely symmetrical and I'm going to name them quickly. Commander, Headquarters, Air Force, Missile, Artillery, tanks, anti-aircraft guns, militia, engineers, infantry. Exactly the same on the blue side, mirroring this side. Now, as I mentioned, the Navy, these guys are not symmetrical in the same way. They're symmetrical with each other, but they um, break the symmetry right and left of the uh, land forces and air forces. These guys are the Navy. They're, they start in this position. That's one startup. The other setup is like this. You take a screen of some kind, keep it between the two sides, you set up your forces however you want, the opponent sets up their forces also in secret, and then before the game begins, boom, the secret is revealed, and you just start fighting wherever you are, however you did. Now that's considered the more advanced. The basic setup is like this, and it's recommended that you get familiar with this arrangement first. And in fact, all of the demonstration games, which I hope you will watch, are also starting in this initial arrangement. Oh, there's supposed to be one more infantry right there. Now everything's symmetrical.